literature and the, the arts, humanitatis, and science. And in those days, literature and everything was on top. The sciences were thought of as slightly lesser. And my argument is today, today, the two cultures are as wide as ever, but science is well on top and the arts nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be seen, not just in school, by the way. I'm going to probably argue that that's throughout culture as well. And we'll, we'll perhaps, if I get that far, talk about that. But first, let's look. Let's get, let's start with a bit of poetry. Start with Goethe. It was a good place to start. And as soon as we study it, we could kill the very soul of what we're talking about. And I think that's an important thing, as we make our pact with the devil. Those of us in the arts trying to make a pact with science, perhaps, and research, perhaps we kill the very thing that we are trying to work on, work with, inspire through. So perhaps we've got to be very careful that Faustian pact that we might be making. You can have moments of pause whilst I wander over to get to the next slide, by the way, and, and thought, perhaps. Now, art. Art, I'm going to certainly start with the OED. It's always a good place to start. Here we go. This is what art is, for those you who didn't know. But I'm interested here, beauty or emotional power, the idea of beauty and the idea of the emotional impact of something. Now, you could argue with this. We, we could talk about whether it's just that, whether there are more things going on there. But those two things are certainly there in the OED. And there's Grace and Perry saying that he loves beauty and saying it with a pot. And perhaps you could argue whether, we could argue whether Grace and Perry is beautiful. We could also argue whether this pot is beautiful, even though it states that it is. Yes, is that good enough? I quite like it. I love his Walthamstow tapestry, by the way. Science. And again, OED, so it must be true. Intellectual, intellectual and practical. Systematic study. This is where perhaps we could think about observation. Observational experiment. I think we can say that that is part of the arts as well, perhaps. Where does it come from? So the etymology of science, quite interesting. I particularly like it because it comes from the trivium. <laughs> the trivium gave birth to science, so I feel like a midwife to science in some way. But here you go. Distinguished from art, though. That, that's crucial. It is not art as such. At its birth, it was a move away from the arts. And in order to establish it, one has to use facts, and one has to say what the facts are, and one has to measure these facts as well. And again, I think that's where we get into interesting problems with the arts. And particularly, even philosophy doesn't quite understand measurement. Does anyone understand measurement? We can be different heights, well, the same height, perhaps, but different measurements of that height. So we could be, you know, these days I think we're going back to feet and inches, hopefully. One of the advantages of Brexit is we, some of us will get back into being the right height, you know, and the right, the right weight. <laughs> now, these things are about facts that we need. Now, it's an interesting book, David Watton, The Invention of Science, talks about three different types of facts. And if you, no, there might be more, I don't know, but brute facts. Brute facts are objectively true or false. There are language-dependent facts and institutional facts. The fact that I am married is an institutional fact. My date of birth, 1312-62, is a language-dependent fact. I am human is a brute fact, though calling me human is a language-dependent fact as well. Yeah. But the, the, you, see, you see what I mean. Okay, so these things. Now, when people say facts are true, they perhaps mean these facts are true. The idea of assessing through precise marks changed not just schools, it changed teaching, it changed children. Now, this to me is a huge problem because if I do, and as I have done, I've had to assess mine, yeah, a mine. This sort of thing, a mime, I've had to assess that and give it a percentage mark. You are 73% mime. Yeah? 
you talked for a bit or something like that. I had to make up some sort of bizarre thing. You are 73% where that person is only 62%. Yeah? These sort of accurate turning in, you know, so, so, so the senior management can say, right, what are you doing about that 62% buying person? I'm getting them to shut up more. You know, what am I doing? So my targets and everything come from that. It changes the whole thing. Because when schools are given the choice between one or other, what are they going to choose? They're going to choose marks over quality. <laughs> yeah, it's the mark, not necessarily the quality of learning or art that's going on that matters more. The mark that matters. Now, a good teacher who's, who's throwing in their own marks out of it will always put down marks that satisfy senior management. That's problematic. Because, of course, the kids also see those marks and think, that's what's happening. I'm a 62% of mine. Which is nonsense. Which is nonsense, you know. It works for some subjects, perhaps. We become mere cogs. And we become dehumanised in that. Which is okay, which is okay. Unless your subjects, of course, are about humanity, or about a different way of understanding humanity. But here we go, the, the heuristic tones of science. Now the important bit here is that if you argue against it, you've got two choices. You either sound like an idiot, because you're not talking their language, or you've got to start imitating their voices. You start saying, right, actually, there are some things that the arts do really, really well. And that's the other argument. So in other words, let me hear this one. Music can get you a higher grade in maths. So therefore study music. Don't study music because music is good or intrinsically of itself useful. Study it because it gets you a higher grade in maths. How many arguments do you hear study maths because they get you a higher grade in music? How much of that research has been done? Would it, would it matter? I mean, can you imagine that piece? Right, um, everyone, study maths, it makes you a better musician. Can you imagine that? People flooding to the music department? <laughs> no. So, if we think of research, science and all that as a religion, and the way of doing things, art is more of a spiritual ideal, if you like, perhaps. Mysterious. Unknown destination. Well, I think that's, that's quite important as well. A lot of art, you start off with something, but you don't quite understand where you're going to end up. You don't quite understand the process. Now, if it's just to get, the reason you're doing this, Mr. Damien Hurst, is to make five billion pounds on your sales, it might be, and that's sort of art. It might be that you want to make your new album and you might make it want to sell a lot. It might be that you're just doing a piece of artwork because you're an artist, and it's expressing something that you're trying to get from inside you, out somewhere. And the whole romantic notion of it, I, I don't know. But certainly, there's a lot of things about destinations. We're trying to do a play, but we're not quite sure what it's going to look like. So it's an unknown destination, even if it's a piece of work. There's an unknown quantity to it, of course. And this is all put together with this idea of the future fallacy. Utility and utopia. So we do schooling for those two things. One, to make a better world, to make you a better person, to make you happy, and the other thing, to give you a great job. And then everything ties around those two ideas, which again, if our, if our destinations are unknown in the arts, it doesn't really help us. So all these things come out, we try and measure them somewhere along the line, and we say, well, this is what the arts give us, these things. Um, kinesthetic learning. Yeah, that's, that's the problem of the arts. The, the arts have given us that. They're trying to say, well, the arts are important, let's have kinesthetic learners. <laughs> they can only learn by dancing. Or, you know, so getting to dance whilst they're doing maths or something like that. Brain basically. Character education, these are all things that the arts are intended to help. Multimedia, critical thinking, 21st century skills, you need to collaborate, you need creative, all these things, so do arts. Well, that's all a nonsense. It's all a nonsense. Anything there, arts for employment. Who wants to do the arts to get a good job? Yeah? Who really wants to do it? The whole point of the arts, you should be, you know, as far as I would say, you should be living in the garret, poor. <laughs> you know, the old romantic notion. You know, contemplating suicide, looking into the abyss. That's what you should be doing if you're a good artist. None of this yourself, you know, if I'm going to create a bit of watercolour here, I'm going to get a better job in the city. 
My God, that's the last thing you want to be an artist, and they probably don't really want you either. The culture industry, yeah, that's an oxymoron. Culture and industry does not belong together. Yeah, industry, industry, the industry, industry, but the culture industry. We make culture in this sort of mechanistic way. Well, look at this nonsense. And these people, you know, you, they actually try and make shows now that attract people to them. So they do a demographic, you know, like they, this, this is going to attract this person, this is going to attract this, and then it's marketing. They think of the marketing before they think of the show. You know? I mean, that. Let it go, let it go. Yeah, that. Have you been to Disneyland? That's what's happened to culture. <laughs> Disneyfied. It's Disneyfied. And this is Eagleton talking here about creativity. Creativity is being pressed into the service of exploitation, you know. I mean, look, there he is, Mr. Creativity. And who's he working for? Unilever. And what's he saying? Dirt is good, play in there, and then wash with Purcell. So do you trust a man who's selling you that? Of course you don't. Because anyone, anyone, I mean, Brecht put it better than I could, really. Because what's, it's the same thing. Robbing a bank is the same as setting one up. You know, so if you're there, you're, doing, you're a criminal as far as <laughs> Brecht was concerned. You're doing those two things. The criminal, the head of chief of police, the bank person, all that together in Thrupney Upper, all the best mates getting together. You know. So the arts should not be in the service of global capitalism. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be there in the service of the school, really. If anything, they should be a thorn in the side. Looking at things from a different angle, looking at things in a different way to make all these things slightly problematic. And as Alan Bloom, the most successful tyranny is the one that removes alternatives and other possibilities. Thomas Nagel talks about it between subjectivity and objectivity. Now, he's saying, basically, either the objective conception of the world is incomplete, or we don't need subjectivity at all. So have a look at that and try and work that one through. Do we need subjectivity? If our view of the world is such that objectivity, science, data, measurement can tell us every truth there is, then great. Let's forget subjectivity. Let's make ourselves part of that machine. Let's take away the subject nature of us, the humanity of us, our human. Or, perhaps there's something missing with that view of the world. So, we need to change the conversation about arts education and research. We need to change it. And this is a senior research associate at Boston College, the professor of psychology, Ellen Winner, saying that same thing. The instrumental arguments are going to doom the arts to failure. The arts need to be valued for their own intrinsic reasons. Have a look at this. A thin veneer of science. I mean, if anything, you know, the, these, this whole idea of character. Happiness. Happiness. You're going to be more happy. You're going to be 7% more happy if you do this program. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very thin science. There's a lot to be said for science. Things can be understood in a completely different way that you can't translate into. Right, if I wrote down a thesis on what the Mona Lisa looks like, I could, you know, say about pixels, or I could say about all these things, facts, facts, facts. You would have no idea what it, the Mona Lisa is like. You'd have no idea at all until you saw the Mona Lisa. And seeing the Mona Lisa, you understand it. But it's not science. It's not a scientific thing. You could talk about the rays going into your eye and all this sort of stuff, but, you say, but it's not science. There was a, a thing, in, uh, uh, what was it, New Scientist or Time, Time magazine. And it said, use these six techniques to find your next lover. Science has proved, and these chat-up techniques. Now, can you imagine someone trying to chat you up using those six techniques, and you knew what they were doing? Would you go to bed with them? The last one, the last one, the six was how to get them into bed quickly, by the way. Would you? Would you? Some of you would. Some of you would. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
the sublime. Yes, so not just the beautiful, we started with the beautiful, let's go to the sublime now. I mean, apart from being in an earthquake, what's the nearest thing to a sort of, ex, ex, you know, that sort of feeling, if you like, is the sublime. That a piece of artwork takes you to places where other things don't take you, takes you to a place of experience. The idea of the sublime. Astonished, aroused to action by this. Yeah. Again, science won't take you there. The struggle to understand ourselves, he, he's, he's an atheist, he's not saying about we should have God, but this, this idea of having something that's not of us. The limits of our knowledge, exploring the limits of our knowledge, which is a scientific ideal, if you like. And not all the answers are in one sense. And our consciousness of ourselves through the arts, through literature, the importance of those things. Um, Scruton talks about it being two doors, if you like. So, so religion, oh, you know, religion, spirituality is one door. The arts are another door, but they both open out into the same room. They both open out into the same room. Now, now, sorry to quickly interrupt you there. Now, you might say, if you're doing it scientifically, for through facts, you might want to say Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, God, man, yeah, which is fact. You're not allowed to do that. All right? Because that's just showing off. <laughs> well done, though. For those who got it right, you got those bits of your exam right. But we're not there now. We're somewhere else. So try again. Try again. If empirical science were the only type of science possible, be in a nasty position. The things as they appear in our experience or the way we experience things, thus the meanings these things have in our own experience. Phenomenology has the capacity to neutralize all the isms around it. So scientism, Marxism, fashion. Have you noticed what the social sciences have done to the arts? You can't look at a piece of art without having to have a discussion about its power, its ideology. Yeah, you don't talk about the art, you work out whether it's been painted by a dead white man. And if it's a dead white man that painted it, it is oppressing you or something like that, or, or, or whatever. So the discussion is no longer about the thing itself. It's a discussion of the science all around it. The Marx, Marxism is a science. It's a science, you know, all these things. So the whole social sciences are coming, the science are coming, everything around it is more important than the art itself. Now, we're talking here, Sarah Bakewell, a wonderful book, wonderful book about the phenomenologists and existentialists. So she moves into Sartre and everyone from this, this idea. So it's very important for if you're, if you're into the bourgeois and such and whatever. It's revolutionary, especially now, I would say, to rid, rid us of utopia, rid us of utility, rid us of social science, rid us of science, rid us of all those things around it, just to bring us down to the thing itself. The thing itself. Just, just try it. Just try it. So life is imbued with our way of understanding it. We are rejecting the objectivity and instead embracing the subjectivity of the thing itself. I'll give you an example of this in, in, in just marking. Marking, yeah, and targeting and all that. A kid comes to you and wants to know about something. They, they, they've got a bad grade. And you start telling them, well, here, I'm going to have a look here. Here's the uh, marking scheme. Right, I want you to do this, this, and this in order to get this, this, and this. In other words, your whole conversation is not about the thing itself. It's about how to get something else from that. What I'm suggesting is the conversations are about the things themselves. In other words, if there's a problem with mime, that you're not getting high enough marks in mime, let's talk about mime. Let's talk about the art. Let's talk about the thing itself. And we have so many other things around us these days that that is quite revolutionary in itself. Try it. It's extraordinarily difficult. So, here we go. Now, you can do lots of background stuff on this, which I don't want you to do. I want you to have the same conversation about the thing itself. The thing itself. And how you react to it emotionally but not getting tied up in your emotions about your, you know, interaction. It's interaction between you and it, okay?
Off you go. Talk about that. She counted the number of flowers. No! <laughs> don't count them! Data! data. No, just go, don't chase all that information that you know is right. We're talking about things we don't know are right. We're talking about the whole subjective nature of it. And it's extraordinarily difficult to do, especially nowadays, because we ain't used to it. Especially in schools. Especially in schools, we ain't used to it. The, 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 the life world is the world in which we inhabit and making that the centre of the science if you like, the actual world in which we do in, in other words, what's, what's all the information and data that's coming at us, you're a white working class boy therefore blah blah blah, they're going to do this to you blah blah blah, it's nothing to do with the boy himself start with the boy himself, now at the same time, all that data is quite interesting and useful, I'm talking about cognitive dualism but I'm saying that what happens is that part of that has taken over and we have no dualism at all and what we ought to do is, yeah, okay, there are big things but there's also local things and art is a very local thing of its time, of its moment and of its interaction with us and that local moment has an importance as well not instead of, those of you who are getting a bit worried about it as well as, as well as. But one can kill the other. Now, let's, let's have a, no, no, look. I mean, that, it, that's perfect. We can also have discussions about what's good art. What's good? You can't give it a percentage, though, can you? You can't just say that is 72%, 80%, 100%. 100%. 100%. Then you can say 100%, then you bloody E.H. Shepherd comes up with something better with eel or with snow on his back but it's good and it's also better than this that's bad art kitsch it's also a balloon it's also being done for other purposes, it is the disnification of art. I mean, there's the commodification all the way through. Okay? Now, I am being prejudiced. I am discriminating. I'm being extraordinarily subjective. I'm not being culturally relative. And for some people, that will be a problem. Can science explain the two? It might do. I mean, it probably can explain that... Um, uh, Hamlet is better than the lyrics of One Direction because of the number of words or something like that but that doesn't get us anywhere that doesn't get us anywhere so look, just, just try this you can have this discussion right, which is better? and I want you to talk about which is better, this or this I want you to discriminate, be prejudiced or just say they're both as good as each other I'm not sure what you know what other thing? But there you go. Which is better and why? And why you don't have to even do why? Which is better, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, Matt, look, if you're an arts teacher, if you're an arts teacher, you can either say, well, the exam board would prefer you to do this because that satisfies the exam criteria down. Yeah, that satisfies the exam criteria we want you to do. We could have that or we can actually tell the truth, which is that is better. <laughs> it is better art. And an arts teacher has to know what's good art and what's bad art, or else there's no point. You must as well teach bad art. 
Let's do bad art, everyone. Let's all do Damien Hurst. Let's drag a few sharks together, stick them in with formaldehyde, off we go. <laughs> yeah? That's bad art, yeah? This is good art. Yeah, good. All right? Let's try. <laughs> but you see it's how I teach art. I actually say, that's good, that's bad, let's have a row. You try and put, you've got, you don't know, because you haven't been educated, you don't know what you're talking about. Let's have this discussion. I don't mean you, I mean them, them in my class. Right, is this good art? Or is that? Which is better? Okay, which is better? Discuss. Off you go, quickly. <laughs> He's walking out, he's offended by the urinal. <laughs> but this, this, which is not Duchamp exactly, it's done by a woman in Duchamp for the uh, and actually this is not the original because that was broken and all those things. But still, that is best of those two. That is better art than that one. Okay, Jeff Coons, Jeff Coons is being ironic, yeah? Ironic, and if it wasn't for the original urinal, I doubt Jeff Coons would ever get away with that. Yeah? Conceptual art. And postmodernism is conceptual art gone mad, really. But there you go. This kitsch, it's, it's knowingly kitsch. It's knowingly kitsch as well. It's not just kitsch, it's knowingly kitsch. It's not, that's, that's the worst form of kitsch. Yeah? Have kitsch that you don't know is kitsch. Yeah? That's better kitsch. Yeah? <laughs> but there you go. And what about this? Hollow Crown or Game of Thrones? Right, which is best? Which is best? Let's talk about it, off we go. George R. R. Martin versus Shakespeare. Okay, now, of course, of course, there's a lot of assumptions, a lot of things there, but we can be biased, we need to be biased, my God, the teacher needs to show bias, the teacher needs to show taste, the teacher needs to show aesthetic awareness that some things are more beautiful than others, or else you just get ugly, or else you just get punching people in the face is just as good as kissing them, you know, I mean, what, what, what do we want? If we have no standards, we have no moral authority, we have no aesthetic authority, why not just make everything ugly? Why not just have litter everywhere? Because it doesn't matter. Beauty doesn't matter. Let's put dog poo over the streets. Actually, there's quite a lot of that going on. <laughs> but, so, yeah, but uh, you know, what do you do? What do you do? There are such things that some things are more beautiful than others. That's difficult. Tim Oates, who Nick Gibb was extolling the virtues of earlier, talks about assessment. And I'm, it's not the same. These, these things are the right sort of assessment he talks about. Rich questions and answers. Discourse. Conversation. Summarised only when necessary, not when the school's telling you to do it every half term. Feedback stimulating higher thought and engagement. So a bit of devil's advocacy there, perhaps. High levels of practice, production, entertainment, and enjoyment. Now that, to me, is... What he's saying about every subject, I think that's exactly what the arts need, and why not every subject? Yeah. But the discussions in the class, not forget about everything else, talk about the thing itself, the art itself, and which art is better than other art, which is more beautiful, what is beauty, what is the sublime, what are all these things? So the conversation becomes about art, about art. And the art that comes to us does take us somewhere. But we don't have to say it gets me a better job in the city or it makes my character 7% happier. A broad range of talents and interests Focusing less on measures and targets. And art has its own intrinsic value, its own way of seeing, 
its own way of not being part of things, its own way of offering other conversations, other ways of seeing. And that, I think, is what should be embraced. I would go so far as to say, it doesn't matter about the EBAC. If anything, why have GCSEs in the arts? Why not just have the arts? Why not just have an exhibition of artwork? Why not just have a performance, a play, an orchestral piece? Why not just have kids doing art? I mean, drama, the drama exam has become 30% practical and 70% written because it's more objective that way and can be marked better. So in other words, less art, marked easier. Well, what's that about? We want less art to do the art. So we're studying the arts. I've got nothing wrong with studying the art, by the way. But you call it a GCSE, then you've got to have Progress 8, and then you've got to do all these targets and everything else. You're destroying the art. Do dance. What do dance exams have? Well, they have four levels, don't they? Uh, pass, distinction, merit, merit, distinction, things like that. I mean, if you want to mark, you can mark in that sort of way. That some things are better than other things. We can't give it a percentage. You can't say that there, this pile of things here. <laughs>